Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 214, featuring a special interview with Mr. David Craddock, a fellow book author. Now David has written a book called Stay a While and Listen, How Two Blizzards Unleashed Diablo and Forged a Video Game Empire. This is the first book of a three-part series all about the creation of the uh, Diablo franchise and much, much more. It's a really provocative read, especially if you are interested in Diablo, but even if you uh, have a broader interest in role-playing games or even even in computer games in general. I guarantee you, uh, you will enjoy hearing more about this book. Anyway, we've got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. David Craddock. All right, folks, I am here with David Craddock. He is the author of Stay a While and Listen, a book about the history of Blizzard North and the uh, Diablo series. He's the co-founder with his wife, Amy, of DM Press, a book publisher that I think you're going to want to keep an eye on if you like this show and the topics we cover. I like to think of uh, David, here's the real life Deckard Kane. How are you doing Stay today, David? Stay and listen. <laughs> <laughs> so it looks like you've got quite the display going there on your table. Can you, uh, you know, walk us through the artifacts you've assembled there? Absolutely. Uh, artifacts recently unearthed from my mother's basement. Every gamer keeps things in his or her mother's basement. Uh, we have the Diablo 1 box and the manual here. Diablo 2 Collector's Edition jewel case and the instruction manual. That looks like manual. a huge that Collector's Edition. How big is that? It looks almost as big as, you, as big as you are there. What? Yeah, I know. It's giant. This is back, you remember the glory days, Matt, when computer oh. game boxes took up like half a shelf all on their own. I, I kind of miss those days. Uh, StarCraft box over here, Warcraft 3 Collector's Edition, which I don't think can really see. And then just, um, I've actually been involved with Blizzard since uh, Diablo. I had an uncle who worked for the company, my uncle Brad. He started out with friends of them. He got me into all the betas of the, uh, uh, let's see if I can grab it without knocking over this whole wall, the original Diablo beta here, which is wow. cool. It's called the Battle.net beta because, of course, that was Diablo was the game that launched the Battle.net service. Uh, so, yeah, just, you know, a number of, of manuals and strategy guides and discs I've collected over the years. So these are just, these are just things that you've picked up along the way. So... Or are you an avid collector? Do you get on eBay and look for certain? Uh, more just merchandise. An avid collector of, of Blizzard stuff. Blizzard, uh, Diablo was actually my first Blizzard game. Uh, that was the first one I played. I played it on my Pentium. Or no, it was a Pentium. It was a 486 So you're walking even slower than you already do in Diablo 1. But I, I played the demo to death. I think it was two levels, but I couldn't get enough of it. And that was kind of my foray into Blizzard. I backtracked after that, played Warcraft 2, and then just kept up with the games from there. Always got the collector's edition whenever I could. You know, day one, midnight launch at, at Babbage's or, or wherever. Now, you mentioned uh, an uncle that was on the... Was he on the Blizzard North crew, or is he just friends with him? Or, or? Sort of. He, he started... Is, is his, is he, are you keeping him anonymous for some reason? <laughs> no, no, no. His name is Brad Mason, and he started as friends with them. Uh, the guys at Blizzard North, uh, then known as Condor, liked to play roller hockey. That was kind of the ways they, you know, forced themselves to get out from in front of their monitors during crunch time and, and work off, uh, you know, some probably some violent fantasies from making Diablo. Um, and my uncle uh, worked for Novell at the time, and he just kind of fell in with them. And Blizzard North actually needed a lot of IT work. They didn't really have anyone who had experience in that area. They, they were actually backing up Diablo on floppy disks. Every day they'd just pass around floppy disks, hope that nothing happened. And so uh, Brad started doing IT work for them. And as the, the favorite nephew, hope, hopefully my cousin Hunter is watching this too, as the favorite nephew, uh, he started roping me into, into the betas. And I even got some exclusive stuff. There was a, a single-player beta that was internal at Blizzard North for a few months. That's not here. I couldn't find it. Um, but I actually got to play that so that you didn't have to be online because, you know, I think I had AOL at the time, so that wasn't the greatest client for, for Internet gaming. But, um, yeah, and he, he roped me into the betas uh, thereafter. StarCraft, uh, Diablo 2, Diablo 2 expansion. So, you know, Uncle Brad with the hookup. It was a lot of fun. And you must have felt like the luckiest kid in the, in the world. Yeah, it was great because I'd go to school and in programming classes, all the kids would be talking about, oh, the, the beta signups for StarCraft just started. Have you entered? Have you entered? And I thought, nope. Don't have to. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm a shoe in So it, it, was, it was really cool to have everyone kind of congregate at my house and and play the betas. And eventually a lot of my friends did get in, so we could do some LAN parties before, you know, the world at large was playing games like StarCraft. It was pretty cool. So you actually got to visit 
San Jose, right? Meet the team eight years ago. Yeah, I did. So how old uh, would you have been at that point? I, I guess a graduate high school graduation. Yes, so. high school. I graduated in early June of two thousand, and as a graduation gift, uh, Uncle Brad again with the hookup flew me out to visit him for a week, and one of the the bold items in our itinerary was um, a trip to Blizzard North. They were in San Mateo at the time, and they were about three weeks out from releasing Diablo 2. So they, I, think, I believe they'd gone gold by that time. They were pressing discs and, and just kind of winding down from a crunch that ended up lasting them about 18 months. And I got to go. I got to. Uh, they had a, a large Diablo statue at the front door that some of the guys would wear, actually, when posing for company pictures. I got to meet David Brevik. I got to meet Max Schaefer. Uh, Rick uh, Cease actually uh, invited me back into their game room. It was a large room with these black leather bean bags, tables all along the wall with consoles set up. They had a Japanese import uh, PlayStation 2, and that was about two months before the console hit the state, so I actually got set up with that. And then uh, some of the programmers took me around. They launched Diablo and they spawned the Diablo boss itself in the town area. And I got to watch Diablo rampage and kill a bunch of, of NPCs. So <laughs> it was a lot of fun to get to do that. And I have pictures from that that um, I actually hope to stick in and stay a while and listen to book two, which covers that area. Diablo 2's development and a lot of Blizzard North's unannounced and later scrapped projects. So before we get into the book, I'm just sort of wondering your own personal attraction to the game. I mean, what is it about Diablo that you know, made such an impact on you that has remained? I guess you probably still actively play it today. If I... Yeah, I actually was, I just closed it a little while ago, running through the game <laughs> for the umpteenth time. How many times uh, have you completed it? Countless. I mean, I was just thinking about that. It's 17 years, almost 17 years uh, since Diablo was released, and I'm still playing it, and Diablo 2. Um, I think the attraction was uh, its accessibility, its appeal. Um, one of the, uh, the sections of the book deals with uh, the guys at Blizzard North talking about the mom test, they called it. They wanted your mom to be able to sit down and play this game within minutes. Uh, you know, so easy your mom could play it. That was kind of their test barometer. And the idea was that every action could be completed through the mouse. You could, in theory, kick back and with just one hand, click your way through this game. Menus, creatures, items, NPCs walking around. And as much as I enjoyed uh, RPGs, I was actually coming from a console RPG background. I played a lot of Super NES around that time. And, you know, there wasn't a lot of, you know, rolling virtual dice to set up your characters, uh, things that computer gamers were probably used to around that time. And so Diablo was just, you know, I entered my, I chose my class, I entered my name, and boom, I was in. And it was just so easy to, to just click around and instantly be in the game and not have to worry about controls and stats, really. Not until I started thinking, okay, where do I want to put these stat points? Um, and also just, I love the reason... Uh, the primary reason I still play Diablo today, and it's actually still my favorite entry in the series, I loved the gothic horror theme. It was just so dark and suffocating. I mean, every level you went down the dungeon, the game just got darker and, and, and more oppressive, and it was just a real... It, it felt like a horror fantasy movie brought to life. And, it, of course, the, the action-oriented gameplay kind of just accentuated that, and it was just so immersive, and I still find it so today. I was reading the, I forget what you called it, the survival guide or sort of the sneak peek at the book, you know, that you sent a while back. Right. And uh, I noticed that there was a lot of uh, material there about how the original design was much, much different than what, and you know, it didn't even have the famous real-time uh, gameplay that everybody, uh, you know, talks about, right? So. Right. Right. When uh, when Condor, uh, later Blizzard North, was, was pitching this game, they couldn't actually get publishers... Uh, to, to take a look at it. They would just kind of turn their nose up and, and shoo Dave, Max, and Eric away. Because as you wrote about it, I read your history of RPG series on Gama Sutra. I mean, in the 90s, computer RPGs took a hit. You know, consoles were getting bigger, and uh, the, the quality of CRPGs was just kind of low. The, the barrier of entry was high. And uh, it was actually Blizzard who looked at the game and saw something there. And it was a turn-based game at this time because Diablo was conceived as a graphical rebirth of roguelike games, you know, random dungeons, random monsters, and, and just a, a treasure hunt all the way through, but instead of text characters, you know, graphics. And it was actually Blizzard Entertainment who signed on first as the game's publisher before their parent company acquired Condor that pushed Blizzard North to 
or Condor to to make Diablo real time. They said, look, you know, we found success with Warcraft, and it's because you're in the moment. Every every click counts, every second counts. We don't want to, the players to get bored sitting there thinking over their next turn. You have to react. And and Condor actually fought that. But uh, there's a great part in the book. It's at the end of chapter eight where Dave Brevik sits down and looks at the code, and he realizes that converting the game to real time wouldn't actually be as tricky as he thought. He does it in I think just a few hours all alone by himself at work and he you know he loads up a test level with the warrior on one side a skeleton over here he clicks and the warrior mon just marches over and psh, smashes it and he knew right then like yes this this is what people are going to want this thing could be pretty huge so he seriously converted it from turn based to real time in a matter of hours yeah they they thought it might take weeks they even called blizzard and said well we'll we'll do this because what they done was they gathered the whole team in the kitchen and that was kind of their meeting place. And they said, all right, Blizzard wants this real time. Let's take a vote. Who, who wants real time? Who wants us to, to you know, dig our feet in and stay turn-based? And most of the team said, well, let's try real time because they'd been playing Warcraft and they really liked the, the in-the-moment feel. And they called Blizzard and said, we'll do this, but we think we might need some more money. And it ended up that they, you know, Dave did it in just a few hours because I guess what, what it was was um, kind of like XCOM where you had action points for every turn, like movement, drinking health, potions, fighting, that all took action points. And Dave thought, well, if I just shrink the window of time between each action to nothing, then it's essentially real time already. I'm just kind of blocking out some, some code. And it was probably a little bit more complex than that, but uh, not complex enough that you know he he needed longer than a few hours to do it. So that was a, he said it was a really cool story, and as he described it, the light from heaven shone down on his keyboard, and he just <laughs> knew that this was something people would really enjoy. Or something similar could be done with the original Fallout games. That yeah, wouldn't that be interesting? <laughs> so tell me a little bit about about Dave. Now, what kind of guy is he? He's a really open honest guy. Uh, some of my favorite memories from working on this book were actually meeting with Dave. What I'd do is I'd drive to his offices in Gazillion in, in San Mateo and I'd meet at his office and we'd walk a few blocks down to a Starbucks just kind of getting caught up and then we'd, we'd order our drinks. I'm a, you know, a sophisticated hot chocolate and whipped cream kind of guy and uh, I'd, I'd just ask Dave questions and he'd just fire it off answer. I mean, sometimes he'd have to kind of dig back through, you know, close to two decades of, of history to, to get at what I was looking for. But most of the time, there was no hesitation. He would just say, because of this. And it was great to have. I, I think that's why I use the quote format in the book, where you read the narrative and then you get quotes from people, because that allows their personalities to shine through. By the end, you'll almost have your favorite character, so to speak. I know uh, you know, my wife liked Matt Allman. Another editor liked uh, Michio Akamura, who was the Condor's first hire as an artist. And, you know, Dave in particular was one of my favorite interviews because he was just so candid and eager to talk about it. You know, he actually told me, I think our first interview, he was surprised no one had approached him about about writing uh, a book about Diablo and Blizzard and, and was really uh, eager to get it down on paper. And, and even guys who were hesitant at first, just because they didn't know how, you know, we would look back on their history because they didn't always do everything right. I mean, they were an upstart company who just kind of, you know... Really, were just uh, picking themselves up by the bootstraps, as they say. And but after a while, everyone I talked to was just really excited for the story to be recorded, almost as much for them as for anyone else. You know, so they could remember that period in their lives. Yeah, I was looking at the structure of the book. You know, you'd mentioned the, the quotations that you have in there, but it's, we understand you're going to have the narrative, the quotes from the developers, and then some kind of interesting sounding sections like side quests and. Right. You know, and, and assets. You know, it almost sounds like you're basing the structure of the book on how a game developer, or I guess a game designer, would go about uh, structuring a game. Did you, did you, was that on purpose, trying to uh, merge those two uh, it, it development was. strategies? It, it was. Not only from the kind of the perspective of a, of a game designer almost, but I figured, you know, we're launching uh, as an ebook because the barrier of entry, again, is very low. It's, it's almost zero dollars. And um, I say almost, but my bank, bank account would disagree. But the, the interesting thing is I thought, well, if I'm going to make this an ebook, let's make it interactive. As you're reading through the story, you know, as you've probably seen, you see side quest markers where if you tap it, you can jump ahead in the book and look at a behind the scenes nugget, something related to the, the tidbit you were reading, and then just jump right back to the chapter where you left off. Um, so kind of a more almost a choose your own adventure where you can say, yeah, I want to see the side quest or now I'm going to keep going with the main story. And then once you're done, 
you can read all the side quests and just kind of soak all that up. And then, you know, I did the bonus rounds, but those were bonus chapters, really, just longer looks at certain things. Like one of the bonus chapters is the making of Warcraft 2, which was important, but uh, I didn't feel it belonged in the main story because a lot of the... Um, I wrote that chapter to kind of really highlight a lot of Blizzard Entertainment's approaches to, to game design and development, and I felt that had already been done in the Warcraft 1 chapters. At the same time, you don't want to leave out a game like Warcraft 2. It's one of my favorite games, and it was influential in their history. So I put it in there as a nugget that people could read when they wanted to get to it. Now, you mentioned this is a, an ebook in mm-hmm. a different format. So just for those who aren't uh, familiar with a they might not have an ebook reader, you know. Mm-hmm. I guess it's available on Kindle, Nook, uh, iBooks. Correct. Uh, so who's not going to be able to read this? <laughs> you know, almost should. everyone will actually, because here's the nice thing: I don't actually have a physical e-reader either. I have an iPad, I have my smartphone, and I have my computer. But Amazon and Nook let you download Kindle and Nook apps, respectively, for free for virtually any platform. Available. I mean, Android phones, iPhones, whatever else, phone, uh, computers, all sorts of tablets. So, you know, probably the easiest way to read it, I think, would be Kindle because Amazon is just everywhere. And so anyone, I mean, when this book comes out, you can say, well, what devices do I have? I have my laptop. I have this particular tablet. I would bet money that you will be able to just download that Kindle app for free and read the book. That's, you know, we targeted those platforms not only because they protect the authors and the work, but because they're so prolific versus something that might kind of rise and fall like Kobo. I don't even know what's going on with Kobo right now. <laughs> Is it still out there? Whereas, you know, where's Amazon going? They're not going to go anywhere. So what would you say to somebody that said, look, look, David, just give me the PDF. I'll, you know, pay you whatever you want. Just give me the PDF file. Uh, the short answer, I guess, would be no. Sorry. But, but uh, you know, we really, I mean, that, that's an option we might explore down the road. But really, we, we wanted to go through those retailers because they're, they're relatively easy to work with and they protect the authors. And they are so widespread. I mean, it's also simple. If you go to Amazon.com uh, as of October 31st, punch in, stay well, and listen and download, you're just going to get it. You don't have to know how to copy it over your, to your device which, again, starts to stretch that barrier of entry, starts to kind of raise it a little bit. Um, so it's, it's going to be really easy to, to access. And, you know, who knows in the future we might be able to do a hardback version. Stay a while and listen in and of itself lends itself to an audio book. That would be a fingers crossed. Yeah, especially if you can get the Deckard Kane guy. To, especially if we can get the Deckard Kane guy. <laughs> who That's is been that a guy? Request. <laughs> his name is um, – oh, I don't want to get this wrong because the name slipped from me. I believe it's Michael Go. Which reminds me of the older actor who played Alfred in the Tim Burton Batman movies and, and beyond that. Oh, sure. um, but yeah, that, that's his name. He's a voice actor. He's done all sorts of things, movies, television, games. And uh, he, he's big enough that I would have to go through his agent who would have to go through someone else who would eventually get made a Michael. But it is certainly an option to look at down the line because who, who better to, to read a Diablo book? Yeah, that'd just be completely I think you should definitely pursue that. Yeah, 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 for sure. It's on the list. Uh, you know, are you concerned about people putting this you know, on Pirate Bay? You know, the, since it's an electronic book, does that mean, you know, to me it just seems like it'd be a real threat. It, it's kind of like pirating console games versus pirating PC games. If we offered this as a downloadable PDF, then I, I bet it would be on Pirate Bay within minutes. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? But yeah. because when you download the book from, for your Kindle or your Nook or iBooks, you don't get a file. It just goes on your account, and then you can read it on a physical device of some kind. So I guess I'm not too worried about it. And we do have plans to kind of circumvent that. One thing we want to do is we've released a number of excerpts so far that uh, Amy and I want to roll into a PDF. And we're just going to put it on Pirate Bay because we figure we're we're confident enough in the book that people will like it enough that they'll go, well, I kind of set out to uh, hijack this ship, but I think I'm going to go and and plunk down the $9.99 and buy it because it's that good. So you you mentioned here that uh, Eric Sexton mm-hmm. as the designer and artist on Diablo and Diablo 2, and he's the one that actually, I guess, inspires you to do this project. So I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on, on Eric's role and all that. Oh, sure. Eric's a great guy, a great friend of mine. Uh, he's at Gearbox Software right now working on top secret stuff. And um, I met him, wow, six years ago now. I moved to the Bay Area in the summer of 2007. And uh, started doing freelance work. And one of my first pitches to official Xbox magazine 
was an editorial on 3D stereoscopic graphics, uh, you know, very ahead of the Oculus Rift even being a glimmer in, in someone's eye. But I wondered, well, is this the future? <laughs> you know, might this be the future of games? And um, uh, Uncle Brad, once again, uh, he was running a game company at the time and working with him were Eric Sexton, Kelly Johnson, and Michio Akamura, among others, who had worked on Diablo and worked at Blizzard North. And so uh, Brad put me in touch with Kelly and Eric, and I interviewed both of them. And Eric and I really hit it off. We met at um, a steakhouse in San Francisco and talked for a couple of hours. I think about 45 minutes of that was interview, and, and the other, the remaining time was just two guys shooting the breeze about games. And so we started hanging out. He had EDF. 2017, I think that's the subtitle for for Xbox 360, and he was like, "Man, this game sucks." And I said, "That's because you're playing it single player. You got to play it multiplayer." So I go over to his house, and we're both blasting giant ants and swatting aside giant spiders, and and it was just, you know, we both had a blast. And I remember driving home thinking, "Man, how cool is this? I'm I'm hanging out with one of the guys who made my favorite computer game." Maybe I should see if he can round up some of his friends, and we can all play Diablo together. Wouldn't that be nice? I'm sometimes a little slow on the uptake, so it took me another hour or two to think, wait a minute, I'm a writer, that's kind of what I do. No one's written the story of Diablo. It's kind of in bits and pieces on the internet, but there are little inaccuracies here and there. So I thought, if, I, if Eric's willing, um, if he thinks I'm a good enough EDF partner, maybe he'll help me uh, round up some of his, his former colleagues. And he did. He got me in touch with Matt Ullman. Um, Michio, Kelly, and, you know, gradually I just started uh, growing my Stay Well and Listen Rolodex. And it was actually Brad, once again, who, uh, who actually helped me really get the project rolling. He gave me Dave Brevik's phone number. And I didn't know when to call him. I was trying to work up the courage to call. Like, what, what am I going to say? I'm just calling this guy out of the blue. Nobody really likes that, you know. So I, I, it was around 6.30 some evening, which wasn't the best time, probably sitting down to dinner. But I, I dialed him, and he answered, and I said... Hi, Dave. My name's Dave, too. I want to write a book on Diablo, and I'd really like to talk to you about that. Do you think you'd have time to do that? <sighs> and he just goes, uh, okay. So that's how we started meeting, and then Dave from there got me in contact with Max and Eric Schaefer. And it was just this, you know, this, grow, this grassroots process where uh, I, I slowly met these guys, and I'm, I'm proud to say I'm friends with them. You know, it was, uh, you, know you, you don't meet someone for hours and hours every week. Over, over drinks and, and lunch uh, without you know, getting to know them. And that was really, again, one thing I wanted to accomplish in this book. I wanted everyone to get to know the minds behind the games. Because, I mean, as you can attest, games are pieces of personality. You know, if, if any one of these guys, Eric Sexton, Dave Brevik, Michio, had been not a part of Diablo, then who knows how big it would have been. You know, the personalities would have been so different. And yeah, the personalities are so key to, to making games. So it was it was really it was a lot of fun getting to know all these guys. Now, when you say you're friends with them, you know, do you think are you concerned at all that you might have uh, written about them in sort of a overly positive light and sort of you know glossed over more negative you know aspects? No, uh, definitely not. Because you know we do explore those areas in the book, and everyone was was very open in that. They all they only wanted to make sure that I would not editorialize, that I would you know just the facts, ma'am, kind of thing. And and I I feel I did that, and I was very very cautious with that. I mean, even if you look in 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 um, one of the side quests, a couple of the side quests for Stay a While and Listen deal with you know some financial disputes, and in another case, so and so saying that well, there's a different version of history how this went down. I made sure to prevent, or not to prevent, but to show all those so that everyone got their time in the spotlight, everyone got their say, and yet, you know, you still know what happened. It's, it's, it's still pretty clear, the, the facts, but I wanted to make sure everyone got their perspective in there, too. And, I mean, everyone, you know, those guys are reading the book, and I've had nothing but positive feedback for them, and I'm very proud of that. And that was something I was very concerned about. I didn't want to compromise my integrity as a writer by catering to friends. I wanted, you know, I was very clear, like, I have a story and I'm going to say this, but if you want to be anonymous, I can put this quote as anonymous if it's, you know, too kind of hot to handle. Uh, if you'd rather I, I not talk about it from your perspective, I can do that. But it's going in, and it's only going in if I feel 
it's uh, you know an, an important piece of the history that contributes to the overall story. You know, not just giving everyone mud to sling after 15 years of being apart from each other. You know what I mean? But it's really there's yeah. not a lot of that. I mean, these were a group of guys who were all friends themselves. I mean, they stayed at work almost all day every day because that's where they wanted to be. They were with friends and and family to a point. So there's no member of the team that's now alienated that they no no <laughs> not not to that extent no i mean even that's good know, yeah that i mean that's great and it's it's also i would say almost a miracle considering even for diablo 2 i mean these guys spent 18 months 12 to 16 hour workday seven days a week around each other i don't care who you are you're going to start getting on somebody's nerves but they're still friends today and that's pretty cool now you'd mentioned that one of the things you really wanted to do with this book is correct a number of inaccuracies in all these various accounts of the games. I just wonder if you give me some examples of some, you know, quote unquote, common knowledge that is in fact just completely wrong. Sure. Well, I know one of the bigger articles um, is um, they mentioned that there, there are a lot of smaller things that, you know, kind of uh, a molehill that grows into a mountain. Like, for example, Condor Inc. was Dave Max's and Eric's company. But there are a lot of editorials out there that refer to it as Condor Software, which was, uh, there was actually a Condor game. So Condor Software didn't even exist. And some articles attribute, you know, oh, they made Planet Soccer. They never made any sports games before uh, getting a contract with a claim to do NFL Quarterback Club. Uh, there were another uh, of other uh, pretty well-known Diablo fan sites who were celebrating the anniversary of Diablo in November when the game didn't even come out until a few days after Christmas in 1996 and saying, yeah, this is it. This is when it was published. I think even Blizzard was on board with that for a little bit. And I'm like, guys, you released this game. Let's, you know, look over your own records here. So I just <laughs> wanted to, you know, I really took pride in, you know, some of the Blizzard guys mentioned this. Like, you're kind of Deckard Kane now. You're the keeper of Blizzard's history. You probably know more than we do because you have all our perspectives, whereas each of us just has ours. And so I, I took a lot of pride in kind of setting the record straight. Even if it didn't really need straightening, I wanted to connect all the dots. You have the whole story rather than just fragments here and there. Well, you talked about getting the team together uh, for lunch on your last day. and You said you right. got some, some fun <laughs> stories about you know how this came together. I mean, was it the first time they'd been in the same room for a while? I think I think so because they all they all live in San Francisco, but you know Max and Eric are running Runic Games, which is located in Seattle, so they're flying back and forth there a lot. Uh, Dave is very busy with his family and with Gazillion. He's captaining that ship, and it was just it was just kind of funny because that was Amy's and mine uh, my last day in the Bay Area and we were running around like mad trying to finish packing get ready for our flight there was a, a pod coming to put our stuff into storage for who knows how long so we were very dusty dirty and tired when we sat down to this lunch but it was still very cool even Amy talks about it. I had just been telling her stories from my interviews like oh I can't wait to write this part you're gonna love this and there was just a lot of energy when the three of them we walked in and they had they had uh, gotten there before us and you know, they were just rapping about things, and there was an energy, and I was just really proud to be sitting down with them and reminding them that, hey, once again, you did meet, eat me eight years ago. It was this googly-eyed high schooler <laughs> looking around at Diablo 2 before anyone else saw it, and uh, it, was, it was very fun to just sit down with them and say, so how do you think the interviews are going? What do you hope to see from the book? And that was two years ago now, two years ago in July. So, um, and in fact, at that point, the book was still one volume. It was going to be all in one, but I... I wanted to have mercy on the forests and and split this up a little bit. So it was yeah, just a lot of fun. 700 page beast, I think you had said. 900 in the first 900. Draft. Good. 900. Lord. And that, you know, I mean, you know how first drafts go, you trim the fat. But that was before a lot of people started writing in and saying, "Hey, you're going to talk about Diablo 3." And I said, "Well, I'm going to talk about Blizzard North's Diablo 3. There are actually two versions in the work before uh, the company shut down." But the more I thought about it, the more doing you know, Blizzard Entertainment's Diablo 3, Diablo 3 3.0 being the version that finally came out. And uh, I just, you know, Amy was really the one saying, you should really think about uh, going the episodic route, if you will, and, and doing three books because it really does make more sense. You know, three Diablos, three books. And I kind of resisted, but I thought, yeah, that does make a lot of sense. Uh, my wife knows what she's talking about, as per usual. So we're going that route. Yeah, triple the sales, I would think, too. Yeah, it yeah, yeah, won't hurt. Yeah. Oh, let's see. Oh, obvious question. Mm. What do these guys think about Diablo 3, at least the, the one that's, that's out? You know? 
<laughs> you, well, did you, uh, <laughs> did you ask him? <laughs> did we've you, talked sort of about duck, it. Uh, nothing, nothing on the record as of yet. Um, and, and I don't know that I'd put it on the record, at least, you know, if it got too heated because, you know, these guys have been respectful as saying, you know, yeah, we started Diablo, but Diablo 3 is not ours, so we don't want to, you know, get too, you know, get our hands too dirty with other people's work. Um, but I know there was a controversy last year where, where Dave Brevett gave uh, some thoughts on how he felt about Diablo, and I thought he was uh, very diplomatic about it and that he wanted to make good points, but... That was actually the first time where a lot of the competitiveness, we'll say, between Blizzard North and Blizzard Entertainment was actually aired publicly. That was the first time that it ever happened. Um, but, you know, as far as what they think about it, I know that they've played it and they've said, well, there's some things we would have done differently. But I know there's a lot they like, too. I know that they felt it, you know, very responsive. And, and uh, yeah, I don't want to speak for them, but... That's about as much as they've been willing to tell me until until I get more involved in book three, which, of course, will explore that Diablo in full. I'm just kind of reading between the lines, though. Do you think that they're, they like it? or? <laughs> I, I think that they're... Are you sensing a little bit of uh, <laughs> mixed feelings? Of, <laughs> yeah, I mean... I, sort of touchy, I, you, know, you know, about... Well, I, I think it would be so hard to see someone else take something you created and just do yes, what they want yeah. with it. I mean, obviously, Blizzard respects Diablo and loves Diablo and, and, and believed in what they were doing. And as a player, I mean, I enjoyed it. I, I didn't think it lived up to Diablo 2. I think it's a lot better now than it was at launch. Then again, at launch, I couldn't even sign on to Battle.net. So, um, <laughs> but, you know, I think that they like it, but certainly they probably would have taken it in a different direction. And, and I know that they would have because I have a lot of information on the Diablo 3s that they were working on before they left. So Sounds like their Diablo 3s was probably much better than what you know, Blizzard yeah, eventually I mean, released it, it probably, it was very interesting, and I don't want to get too into this now because this is something to explore more in book two, but you know, there was a lot of pressure on them to deliver a Diablo game. You know, they were originally working on Diablo 3 as an MMO. Not a, not a WoW style, like behind the shoulder view, but all the fast-paced Diablo action, but in a persistent world. And then when they scrapped that and went with the, the action RPG model, kind of Diablo 2, with 3D graphics, they were really trying to decide, well, we can do this, but how can we also differentiate it so that it's not Diablo 2.5 or Diablo 2 3D? And so that was something they were really struggling with. And they got, I think they said the game was about maybe 40 to 50% done by the time Blizzard North closed in 2005. But I know they had a lot of interesting stuff in the works that really excites me and that I wish I could have, I could have played you know, in full, fully realized. It's kind of a little bit off topic, but I'm just very curious, you know, what what you think about this whole uh, Diablo three and the uh, what is it, online auction or auction store? That I'm of, not a fan. You know what I'm talking about? I think they yes, recently I do. Yeah, they the shuttered it a house. few months ago. Yeah, always online. I I could live with the auction house. I I tried it, you know, just because it's there, and which is one of the dangers, right? Like if you're playing a loot based game, you don't want to leave the game to get loot. That, you know, kind of belittles the the point of its existence. Um, I was I was more turned off by the always online because, you know, like you, I'm a gaming historian. A hundred years from now, if if Bl if Diablo three servers are offline, that's it. Unless you want to get a hold of a, an old junky Xbox three hundred and sixty or PS three somewhere and play the console version, and I, I don't like the idea that any piece of history can just be gone and you know never again to be experienced unless you're watching YouTube videos or playing on a console or something. Um, also, there was this precedent. A lot of people are saying, well, why are you upset that it's always online? It's, it's a multiplayer game. Diablo 3 was a multiplayer game, yes, but Diablo 1 and 2, I was able to enjoy on my own, even when my internet was down from a storm or whatever reason, and I just kind of, you know, I kind of feel jaded toward the whole thing because I couldn't enjoy it on my own time and my own terms, even though it was a fun game. I mean, again, uh, it seems like any big name game with an online launch, it's just going to be broken for like three weeks. You know, Grand Theft Auto Online is going through the same thing. Sim City, same thing. Diablo 3. And gee, I paid $60 for this game. I'd like to sit down and play on my own terms. That doesn't seem unreasonable, you know. Do they have thoughts on, was it Sierra that did the was it Hellfire expansion for the? Yes, yes, I, I do. I, I remember when I was doing the research on it. I, I sort of. Uh, it seemed to me that they were kind of negative about it. That it didn't didn't live up to their expectations. So, did you have a different view? Yeah. Um. 
I think that that's probably accurate. I mean, they were given a three month deadline initially. And even though, you know, you're working with an expansion pack, so there's kind of, you have a leg up because the code is already there. You're just expanding on a game rather than building something from scratch. But <clears throat> Blizzard Entertainment and Blizzard North were both, both very protective of Diablo. It was their baby, um, which was understandable. And they really didn't want anyone else working on it. And in fact, that decision was taken out of their hands. I think that was the point that bothered them the most. Their parent company at the time, uh, CUC, uh, said, well, if Blizzard North doesn't want to do an expansion, which they didn't, they wanted to do Diablo 2, then we're just going to sign it to someone else because Diablo is printing money right now. And so, you know, again, it's it's that someone else has your baby and is just doing what they want. And so that was difficult for them to to come to terms with. And, you know, I think there were some quality issues. But I actually, when I play Diablo, I always have Hellfire installed. Because even if you don't like the new content, like the Nest levels, which... You know, one complaint was oh, these these green slimy caves where all these insects are crawling around. That doesn't really gel with the Diablo Gothic horror theme. Then again, in Diablo 2, you're climbing bright snowy mountains. You're going across sun-baked deserts. You're in swamps fighting giant mosquitoes. So it seems like that wasn't very far removed from what Diablo was going to become. Um, I really like a lot of the changes it made to the base game. I mean, if you remember in Diablo 1, when an item dropped on the floor, you couldn't press a key to highlight it. You just had to wave your cursor around and see if it lit up. Uh, Hellfire added a, a spell called Search, which just illuminated everything. Gold, weapons, potions. That was nice. There was uh, You could move twice as fast in town, which was great for running errands and junking your stuff, whatever. Uh, so there were all, a lot of those little incremental updates that I thought made Diablo a tighter game. And so I really enjoyed Hellfire. I was looking at this quotation you sent me, and you know, like you being a, a game historian, you know, I worry sometimes that the same thing that happened to early film history is going to happen to games because uh, you know a lot of uh, the stories about how those old, especially before the you know sort of big cinemas when they were still doing the sort of peep shows and things of that sort, you know, <laughs> right. really early. I mean, most of that's just completely gone now. Mm -hmm. And you got a quotation here. I guess you were interviewing somebody, and they they said, you know, why are you even bothering with this? You know, this is an old game. It's dated. Uh, you know, who basically why is why should anybody be interested in this? Right. Yeah. You know, so how did you respond to this this person? Well, um, and it's funny because I've been sending the book out. You know, I sent it to you. I sent it to a lot of critics. And I sent it to a lot of game developers just so I could get some endorsements. Hopefully, endorsements. And. Um, one guy, I can't remember who now, they're kind of blurring, which is good, you know, positive uh, press coming in. But he said that there are still a lot of lessons to be learned, and, and I think that's true. I mean, if you look at today, game developers have tools for everything. If you want to build levels, you can download the, the Unreal Development Kit or, or any number of proprietary in-house tools and just build it. Um, you know, same with creating art. Uh, programming, you have all these built-in libraries that you can you know, pass around or buy. In the 90s, it was kind of like the Wild West. I mean, the games industry existed almost in name only. I mean, it was really Nintendo and Sega driving the consoles and PC developers just kind of doing what they could do to, to attract interest. And um, Diablo was a game that was built by a company on a shoestring budget. That was, that was Dave Brevik's term for it. And they just had to make things up. Like they said, well, we can only have so many monsters on a level. How can we have more monsters? Oh, I know. We'll just dip them in different colors, paint, and boom, suddenly you have like over 100 monster types in this game. And people loved that. And it was that was born not of a creative idea initially, but how can we juggle our resources to, to get more monsters in every level? And I think it's important to to really know your roots, to know where you came from, because if you don't, I mean, you can say this about any any history, not just games, but if you don't know where you came from and you don't know the the foundation that holds the building you're in, well, then how can you build something even better? You know, how can you improve on that? And I just think that, especially, you know, I wrote this book for a lot of audiences. I wrote it for for people who, you know, Masters of Doom. A lot of people who read that just wanted a story that happened to involve video games. Other people, maybe they're budding game developers, and they want to know, well, how did these guys make this classic game? Because if a game like Diablo 2 is still on stores almost 14 years after its release, it did at least one thing really well, you know? And so I thought, well, let's capture that. Let's DM Press stands for Digital Monument Press. I wanted to create digital monuments to the people 
and and the games they made and and those eras and i just really feel it's important to preserve that so people can know uh, where these games came from and how they were made and you know serve as lessons for for future game makers yeah i couldn't agree you know couldn't possibly agree more with that you know and even if uh, you know I, I to me it makes the game play itself a lot more enjoyable Absolutely. You know, if you know a little bit about the people that made it if you know why these decisions were made right that, just might you know why do they have all these different colored monsters? Well, you know now you know, and I think that's going to make the the game more enjoyable. Sure, and I, I mean I think it's you know today we have we're going to have the Xbox One, we're going to have the PlayStation Four, we have these monster PCs with graphics cards that they themselves have more memories than computers could have ever dreamed of having twenty years ago. Not video memory, but just you know onboard RAM, and. Even even despite that, there are still going to be bottlenecks, and it's really it's kind of nice to know that hey, someone before you has had this problem. Here's how they kind of thought outside the box. So maybe this will influence you. Now, so let's talk a little bit about your background as a writer. Mm -hmm. You know, did what do you uh, major in English in college or? I majored English? in English and video games in college, <laughs> playing them <laughs> probably entirely too much. I, I actually jumped around a lot. I started out. Today I'm writing about Blizzard games. I started out wanting to make Blizzard games. Uh, Uncle Brad, he's a recurring character. He, he'll, he'll actually be in the books in two going forward. But, you know, he got me into programming. He got me my first book on, on Quick Basic, you know, Q Basic. And, and uh, I remember I, I went into a computer store that my friend's dad owned. And one of the guys there agreed to, to give me lessons. So every week he'd come over and we'd sit down and write programs together, little games. I eventually got burnt out on that because of some bad experiences. And so in college, I would take like 18, 19 credit hours of computer science courses, you know, prereqs, programming. And then I would throw like a literature course and a writing course on there just to just kind of relax. You know, it was more work, but it was fun. And one semester I wrote a paper on um, – Hopefully, I still have it somewhere, but it was about like why, you know, around that time, Harry Potter was very big. Uh, not that it will ever be anything but big again, but, you know, parents and, and groups were saying, well, should we ban these books? Are they encouraging witchcraft? And my point was, no, that's very dumb. Why would you think that? It's great the kids are reading, you know? And uh, my teacher, this was a young adult literature course, my teacher passed. Uh, the paper's back, and she actually said, David, would you read yours aloud? And I started reading. She said, no, no, stand up. So I'm feeling even more self-conscious. Like, I either did something great or something terrible. And, and you know, it went over really well. She loved it. The class loved it. Amy's over there. She probably knows what's coming up. She knows this story. And I was leaving class, and um, uh, my teacher caught up with me. She's this little woman, comes up to about my chest. I'm about 6'2". And she says, well, what's your major right now? And I said, oh, it's computer science. I want to. And she interrupted me by bopping me on the head with her folder filled with papers. And she said, quit screwing around with computers. You're a writer. You need to write. And that was kind of like the light bulb. Again, very slow in the uptake. I, well, I never really thought about doing this professionally. I guess I could, I could write. So I, I dropped the computer science courses. I still like to program, but just as kind of a hobby. You know, some people do Sudoku to give their brain a stretch. I like to program. And uh, I've been writing ever since. I was very rough at first, but I just kept working at it. Unlike with the programming, I never got burned out. I started uh, writing about games. That's, you know, one of the, I mean, any gamer wants to do something with games. So my idea was to write about them. And I did that for free, pro bono, for about a year. And uh, started writing for shacknews.com. They kept me around for two years because I think they saw glimmers of brilliance occasionally, but it was still rough. But I was very, I was very excited, and I wasn't just trying to crank out words. I, I was really trying to learn more about what I was doing and how to make it better. And I just kept going from there. And I feel like every outlet that gave me a paycheck also gave me an opportunity to get better at, at my craft. For example, uh, Xbox Magazine, Xbox, our official Xbox Magazine would say, we need a review and you only have 100 words. And I thought, well, how am I going to do that? But that was great because I had to learn, you know, you know writers uh, omit needless words and speak in the active voice. And you have no choice but to do All that. Drunk and white, huh? Yeah, exactly. Yep. You got, that's my little Bible. I've got it right next to Elements of Style. And um, it was great because I had to learn how to get to my point and, uh, you know, 100 words or less. And my first published short story was flash fiction. I had about 1,000 words. And it's still one of my favorite pieces because it's just so tight. You know, I didn't have time to just kind of blather on. I had to get to the point. I had to, had to tell a good story. And um, 
I think it's 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 going well. Fast forward a little bit. I've got five stories, uh, short stories published. Stay well and listens coming out. And next summer, I have my first young adult novel going to be published by Taiki Books in July. So I'm pretty excited about that. Have you read the Diablo novel? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> it's funny you mention that. Uh, in 2009. Blizzard held a short story contest where you could write a story in any of their three universes, and I chose Diablo, of course. Um, Diablo players know that uh, if you receive the Butcher quest, that quest starts when you, you walk through Tristram, and right outside the church, there's a, a wounded townsman. And I thought, well, who is this guy bleeding to death on my front lawn? So I gave him a name and a story, and he was one of the guys who who dared to go down and confront the butcher who was, you know, absconding. Well, it was Lazarus, I think Diablo's right-hand guy, who was kidnapping children. But the butcher came into it, and uh, so that was my foray into, into Diablo fiction. I have one of the novels in front of me right here, but I never got very far into it. I think at the time I had started writing, and, you know, I was, I was more... Uh, involved with writing my own stuff than reading a lot at that time but i do want to jump into it since i have book one of who knows how many here at this point oh uh, one one thing i wanted to ask i know you, on the website it says dm press uh, is not doesn't take uh unsolicited manuscripts or, or i guess you're not <laughs> interested in publishing other people but is that something you see changing eventually or is that you know, that is something I would like to see change. I think when we get big enough that people are kind of starting to knock at the the proverbial door. I mean, I <clears throat> there's no dedicated publisher for for books like like Stay Well and Listen and <clears throat> and just other memoirs. And so I thought it would be cool to give you know uh, industry professionals an outlet to tell their stories instead of just having me tell them. Well, David, is there anything else that you'd like to talk about that we haven't covered? Um, no, I think we've, I think we've hit it all. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. I mean, I've been looking forward to it and, um, I guess just, you know, if you enjoyed this interview, you know, we've got, if you go to, uh, our Facebook page, <clears throat> we've got some, some excerpts from the book you can read. And of course you can find it, uh, on Kindle and Nook and, uh, iBooks, Apple's platform. So I hope people enjoy it and I hope you enjoy it, Matt. Thank you. That's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back soon, hopefully later this weekend, but uh, if not, definitely by next week. Uh, with that retrospective I was telling you about, uh, it, as it turns out, I bit off a little bit more than I could chew with this particular role-playing game. It was more complicated than I thought, so I need some extra time to play it, familiarize myself with it, make a halfway a decent video, so I know you'll appreciate the uh, video much better if I actually know what I'm talking about when I try to review it, so uh, please stay tuned for that. Uh, as always, I want to thank you very, 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 very much if you have supported this show. Remember, you can do that at mattchat.us. Really appreciate your monetary donations. You can sign up for a dollar a week or uh, five dollars a month, uh, whatever suits your budget. Uh, that money is very, very appreciated. Uh, but also, if you mention the show somewhere on a forum, if you write a review of it somewhere, or even leave some comments on YouTube, I appreciate all of that as well. Thank you guys very much for all of your support. Now what about that all-important ale of the week? Uh, this week I've got a little thing called the Surly Brewing Company Furious Beer. Now this has been uh, causing quite a stir up around these parts. It's uh, brewed in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, uh, but for whatever reason the local uh, store where I like to buy my ills was having a hard time getting this despite the pub uh, <laughs> public demand for it. So let's see, a tempest on the tongue or a moment of pure hop bliss? Well, brewed with a dazzling blend of American hops and Scottish malt, this crimson-hued ale delivers waves of citrus, pine, and caramel toffee. For those who flavor, who favor flavor, favor flavor, uh, Furious has the hop fire your taste buds have been screaming for. Well, let's see about that. 6.2% uh, alcohol, so respectable alcohol content on this one. Uh, beer from a glass, from a can. Well, we'll see about that too. <laughs> anyway, they've uh, really told a good story here, so let's open up this can and see what it's all about. All right, so I've got some of this furious beer here in the rather excellent drinking horn. 
You know, every now and then I get uh, people asking me about where I got this horn from. Uh, it's from a guy named Steinar E. Viking, and he's on Facebook. You can find him and talk to him. He's a pretty fun guy. Does a lot of the festivals around here. Uh, but anyway, if you are shopping for a horn, I'll just uh, recommend uh, that you get one about the same size as your bladder. That way, uh, by the time you're ready to go to the bathroom, uh, you don't have to worry about spilling any beer. Anyway, let's see about this Furious. <sighs> you can definitely smell the hops on this. It's a, uh, you know, it smells very hoppy. You get that sort of uh, a mild bitterness, a little bit of uh, acidity there in the uh, aroma. Definitely tell this will be a bit on the bitter side. Hopefully it won't be too bad though. Anyway, uh, let's give it a taste. <laughs> you can definitely taste the, as I suspected, it is quite bitter. Get a bit of a sort of little coffee taste in there. What do they say, pine? Uh, I don't know about pine, but I'm definitely tasting a lot of a sort of a burnt coffee-like flavor to it. I'm uh, definitely tasting the hops uh, big time. Let me try one more taste here. Mm. Just about the right level of uh, thickness. It's not watery at all. You get a lot of flavor with this. Obviously, it's not something you would want to... Uh, you know, chug. Uh, this is definitely a sipping beer, which is, you know, quite nice considering how strong it is. Let me try uh, one more, uh, one more taste here. Mm. You know, it's not bad. Um, the bitterness, it isn't unmanageable, and the the aftertaste is quite pleasant. The sort of bitterness goes away quickly. Um, actually, kind of, uh, you know, refreshing this. Uh, this one. I actually quite like this. Uh, where to put it on the drinking horn scale? I guess I'm going to go four out of five drinking horns on this uh, Furious beer. It's uh, quite good. It's definitely a little bit on the bitter side, uh, on the darker side. Uh, they said it was kind of a, it almost made it sound like a red ale on the package, but I would put this in the, taste to me like a, you know, a really good IPA, I guess, uh, more than anything else. But anyway, uh, four out of five drinking horns on that. Let's wrap this up with a quotation, and I was looking uh, for good quotations about writing by writers, and I found a good one from Ernest Hemingway. It goes something like this. There is nothing to writing. All you do is sit down at the typewriter and bleed. See you guys next week. Farnham has taken to drinking quite heavily since his encounters in the labyrinth. But within the ramblings of this drunken man rests a legend well steeped in myth and mystery.